Now, I imagine you deal with some temptations. But what is your greatest temptation? I mean, you don't have to tell me. Uh, this is you know, just uh, rhetorical in the sense that you can do it in your own mind. What's your greatest temptation? Now, let me, let me back up and tell you what James has been teaching us. What would you say... If someone asked you, what was the primary message about the book of James? If he said, there's one thing you deal with that you need the most help with, what would James say that would be? I give you a hint where it's located. Underneath your nose, between your teeth, and in front of your throat. Any guesses now? Your tongue. Probably the greatest temptation we have is the way we use our tongue in inappropriate ways. James warned us that if we don't get a hold of our tongue, then we can't control the rest of the body. But he says, if the tongue can be controlled, guess what? You're now positioned to be able to control every other aspect of your body. That's amazing to me, how powerful the tongue is. So our greatest temptation is how we inappropriately use our tongue. So we're going to resist that today. Not by not using it, but by trusting God to help us use it in a way that's honoring and pleasing to him. Now, all temptation is basically unavoidable in the sense that we're going to be confronted with things that are going to try to get us away from doing God's will and doing our own will or even demonic will. So as long as we live in this world and we live with the realization that our flesh is still there, you and I are going to contend with temptation. We've already said that temptation does not come from God. In James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, it says, uh, don't, say, don't say that temptations come from God because God tempts no one. Matter of fact, temptation really comes as a result of our own selfish desires. And we see those temptations out there, and then we have the tendency to go after them. So we are taught to pray by our Lord in that model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, there was a bumper sticker that said, lead us not into temptation, I'll be able to find it on my own. That's simply the way you and I work. We really don't want to go into it, but we don't mind because it kind of is appealing to us. Realizing that when temptation does come, you and I most likely as Christians, we want to move as far as we can away from it. And so we want God's power. We want to turn to God during those times. Because God will always provide a way out. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says that with each temptation... God is faithful. He will always provide for us a way that we might be able to stand under that temptation. So we'll be strong and the temptation will not have to control us or take over. We can resist it. God has done that for us. He's provided a way. And James is going to help us understand what that is. Now, when you and I find ourselves in a place of temptation, here's what we're basically doing. God's standing there. We're on this mountain. There's a large cliff, and we're basically walking toward the cliff. And, and, and God's back here saying, don't, don't do that. You make one more step, and you know what? You're going to have to face some grave consequences. Why don't you just come on back? And then what we do is basically say, God, I understand you're God, and you know how to do things, and you're probably the boss, and, and you probably have it right, but you know what? This just feels good. And then we take one more step, and God says, I've warned you. I have tried to get your attention, 
But if you're going to take one more step, you're on your own. And so inevitably what we do, God, this feels good and I want to do it. I believe I need to go in this direction. You take that last step and you hit nothing but air. And then you suffer the consequences of the decision that you made. That's what basically temptation does to us. It leads us to a place where we find ourselves in a pit. Praise God that he doesn't leave us there when we do act so foolishly. But how can we avoid getting to the edge of the cliff and taking that step and ending in devastation? Well, let's look what James says. Number one in your outline. I'm going to move real quick because Jenny took all my time. <laughs> but I was so blessed by that. You know, the Bible says that, you know, God, when you, when you ask, he gives you, you know, more than you can even ask or imagine. And when you and I pray, like on Wednesday nights, and we pray that we can be a blessing to people, and, and this family shows up at our church, and we have the opportunity to bless them, what a privilege to be used by God that way. And then God turns that around and takes this family and blesses us. That's more than I can even ask or imagine. You guys have been nothing short of a blessing from God to us. And the little bit we've had to impact your family's life, we're just thankful God has been able to use us for that. So you'll be eternally remembered. Thank you. First thing you need to do, James tells us, rem humble yourself before the Lord. First thing we have to do is humble ourselves before the Lord. And that simply means this, that he's the boss. You know, when he's standing on the cliff telling you, don't take another step, listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. So we humble ourselves before the Lord. No matter how good it feels, just know what is right. Turning back to the Lord. Now, how do you do this? You rely on God's grace. Letter A. Look at verse 6. I want to back up to verse 6. He says, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And what is grace? Grace is that you don't have to face that temptation alone. That God, with all the power of heaven, all of his glory will empower you to resist that temptation. He makes that available to us. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it, but he's providing it for us. That's the grace of God. And those who humble themselves and acknowledge his lordship and his greatness, he provides this for you to turn from that temptation and to resist it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when Paul was suffering and asking the Lord to deliver him three times from this fleshly problem, the thorn in the flesh, and finally God said to him what? In verse 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. I'm giving you what you really need. You think you need the healing. You need my power, and gracefully I'm offering it to you. You and I, that's what God has provided for us. By grace, that power to resist that temptation. Because we're not capable of our, on our own. Let it be. Submit to God. Oh, that's that word nobody likes. We just went through that in Sunday school. Submit. We don't like that submit thing. Well, if you acknowledge God as God, then he's Lord, and you've got to follow the logical sequence. He's the boss. And so we submit to him. And what does that mean to, to submit? It basically means that we submit to his will. He knows a lot better than we do. He's the one who created all things. He created you. He, he basically wrote the owner's manual. He is the one who knows how it all works. He not only knows what's going to happen when you make a decision now, 
He, he knows in the future how that's going to impact the future. He knows everything. And so if he can see what's going to happen in the future, then he's going to guide you at this moment in the decision that you're making. So submit to him. His will. Remember, Jesus did that in the garden. He said, Father, not my will be done, but yours. And he submitted himself to the Father. And how do we do that? It's not a mystery, folks. Right? You and I know that doing what God wants is not a mystery. It's not hidden somewhere in heaven, but he has given it to us in his word. He's revealed it to us. We know what to do because God told us what to do. And we know what not to do because he said, thou shalt not do those things. And if you practice that, guess what? <laughs> You're going to stay away from those things that are going to tempt you to do your thing rather than God's thing. God wasn't kidding, Jenny, when he said, do not be unevenly yoked. For your situation, that was amazing. That's not the norm. The norm is that you are headed for a horrible marriage relationship. God's not kidding. Don't be unevenly yoked. My point made. So when God commands us to do one thing and we do our own thing, we're in trouble. He is God, we are not. Letter C, then we're going to gain resisting power. When we do it his way, we got now the power to resist. Look at the latter part of verse 7. But resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How easy is that? Not very. How simple is it? Very simple. Resist the devil, and what does he do? He flees from you. Gone. When Jesus was in the, the wilderness, as a spirit led him there in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, the devil took this opportunity to, to tempt him. If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And he answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Where, where, did, he, where did he get that from? The Bible. He got it from the Bible. He knew what God's word said, and he applied it in that moment he was tempted. And then he did it again. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels order concerning you. He's trying to take scripture now and turn it against him. Then they will support your hands. Or with your, support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And then Jesus told him, it is written, do not tense, test the Lord your God. And then Satan said, look at all this out there. It's everything. It's all mine. It was given to me back in the garden. And it's all mine. I'll give it all to you if you'll just fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said clearly, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What gave him the power to resist? The power of God's word. And he used it. So you and I, we humble ourselves knowing that God has the better and the right way. And he's revealed it to us through his word. If we'll open up his Bible and read, we will know what he wants. And we can resist the temptation to do what we want. All right, letter, oh, number, I'm sorry, let me move quickly again. Number one, that's a path, it's a path to victory. This is a path to victory. And if you read the book of Revelation, there and to the letters to the first seven churches, or seven churches, uh, all of them are told this, if you'll do this, you will, you'll be a victor. And to the victors, he gives them something over and over again. I'll give the victor, I'll give the victor, I'll give the victor. Those who will not submit to evil, but submit to the ways of God. And what do you have victor over, victory over? Number two, victory over Satan and his schemes. What are Satan and his schemes? Remember I told you, told you before, the possibility of every, any one of us having a direct conflict or confrontation with Satan is probably pretty slim to none. Remember, he's not omnipresent. 
So he can only be in one place at one time. But here's what he has done. He has affected all of us by what he has put into place. He has put this world system in place because he knows what he has put in place has the ability to take your flesh and get a hold of it. If you'll let him. So it tells us that we'll have victory over his schemes. What are his schemes? In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, they're pretty simple. He, Jesus, or, uh, John says, Do not love the world or the things that belong in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of one's lifestyle. That's what he's put out there for us. The lust of your flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of your lifestyle is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away. But the one who does God's will remains forever. Remember, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So you are going to have this supernatural power to resist the super supernatural power of trying to get you to do what is contrary to the will of God. And God will give you that victory. And he will call you a victor. Now, the last thing I want to remind you of, resist the devil. Do not rebuke the devil. You hear me? Resist the devil. Do not rebuke. We don't have the authority to rebuke the devil. Let me make my point. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 20 says, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebukes you. Who rebukes Satan? The Lord does. He's done that. We just accept what he's done. Matter of fact, so powerfully written in Jude chapter 1, or 1 verse 9, yet Michael the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil in a debate about Moses' body, did not dare to bring an abusive condemnation against him, but said, the Lord rebukes you. This is Michael, the archangel, does not re bring a rebuke against the demons. Michael, the archangel, you and I were not at that level. And he wouldn't do it. So you and I are not called to rebuke the devil. We are called to resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Now that's spiritual warfare. Now how does that look for you and me? Number two, it's being in the presence of God. Being in the presence of spiritual warfare is, is, is so important that you and I find ourselves being in the presence of God. And how do we do that? Well, we open up his word and let him, let it, he, we, we allow him to speak to us. And if we do that, being in the presence of God, when we open up his word, knowing that this is not just ink on a paper, it's his revelation to us. He's trying to teach me about himself. Letter A, I'm going to grow in a relationship with God. Grow in your relationship with God. You, you can't help open the Bible and have God share about who he is and not grow in that relationship. That's what happens in a marriage when a husband and wife come together and uh, they're, they're newlyweds. They spend the rest of their lives learning more about each other and enjoying each other even more. And that's what Heather and I have done. We have learned so much about each other over the years. Some things she probably wishes she doesn't know about me. But the point is, it's strengthened and deepened our relationship. We've gotten to know each other. Draw near to God. She just said in verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's what you need to do. If you want to be in spiritual warfare, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, because you need him. And he will show you who he is. Well, John said in John 17, 3, when Jesus 
spoke, he prayed, and he said this in verse 3. He said, this is eternal life, that they may know the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. No, that means to have that deep, intimate relationship with God. Letter B, when you come into God's presence like that, and you're opening up his word and he's speaking to you, and you're going closer to him, and you're knowing more about him, you're going to gain a keen self-awareness. And when you see yourself or who you are in the presence of a holy, righteous, perfect, omnipotent, knowing God, you'll see yourself or who you are. Remember Isaiah. God had been working in Isaiah's life, and in chapter 6 it tells us that the temple was filled with the glory of God. And God's presence showed up. And what was Isaiah's response? Oh, am I a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips? I see God for who he is, and I see myself for who I am. And he needed a cleansing. So number one, when you come into God's presence, I'll tell you, you will be keenly aware of how dirty you are. An outward cleansing. Cleanse your hands, sinners. You know, outward cleansing. Are there things you just need to get away from? Hey, if the internet's what's causing you to sin, then throw it out. If going to certain places cause you to sin, stop going there. If hanging around certain people cause you to sin, stop hanging around with them. Cleanse your hands. Remove these things from your life. Number two, a need for inward cleansing. You see, because everything we do on the outside that's sin is the result of what is on the inside. There's the problem. That's where it lies. Look at verse 8, the latter part. And purify your hearts, double-minded people. Jesus said for in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, for from the heart comes every evil thoughts, murders, adulter uh, uh, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, blasphemies. So everything we do on the outside, it's a result of what's going on, on the inside. So we need not only outward cleansing to turn away from things, but we also need our hearts cleansed. Jeremiah 4.14 tells us, Wash the evil from your heart, Jerusalem, so that you will be delivered. How long will you harbor malicious thoughts within you? Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 31, throw off all the transgressions you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, house of Israel? And in chapter 36, verse 27, the Lord said this, I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. You see, we live in the spirit then. We live in the presence of God knowing that we can rely on his spirit, his presence living within us rather than our own fleshly, selfish desires. And let us see that positions you, when you're in that position before God, cleansed, humbled before him, we are positioned for God to exalt you. You think that submitting to God, humbling yourself to God is some sort of a weak vessel performance. It's not at all. It's the position and the place where God then can exalt you. And who else would you like to exalt you than the one who's created you and the one who sustains you and the one who is in control of everything? That's the one whom I want to be exalted by. And he said, then God will exalt you. It tells us, be miserable and mourn and weep. When you see yourself for really who you are in the presence of God, that's going to be your experience. Your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrow. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Jesus said this in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the ones who know who they really are, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You in that place, you and me in that place, God has told us that we're in the kingdom of heaven. 
We're citizens of something that's going to last forever. How more exalted can you be than to know that you're part of the kingdom of God, the family of God, a child of God? Let God exalt you. And then number three, humble, humble before the Lord avoids the great temptation of, letter A, judging others. Look at verse 11. Don't criticize one another. See, when you see yourself for really who you are and the power of God's working in your life, your goal is not to bring others down by pointing out all their flaws and errors. You see your own, and your hope is to help others in their flaws and errors. Remember Jesus said, why are you trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you got a log in your own? Get the log out, then you can help your brother. Then you can help him. Philippians 2, 3 says, do not do uh, anything out of rival, rivalry or conceit, but in humility, considers, consider others as more important than yourselves. In Matthew chapter 7, do not judge so that you won't be judged. Now, he's not saying you don't ever judge. He's basically saying don't ever condemn people. Don't put people down to make yourself look better. God's already exalted you. How much better do you have to look? Let her be. It'll avoid you from, tempting, from the temptation of judging God. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? Judging God. But people do it all the time. Look at verse 11, the middle part, or the latter part. He who criticizes a brother or judges his brother criticizes the law and judges the law. Who gave us the law? God did. What gives us the right to be able to judge what God has given us, the law? But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a, a judge. That's God's job. How many people complain about God? Have you ever complained about God? God, if you're really who you claim to be, why do you allow these things to happen? And God says, well, I do allow these things to happen because of who I am. I'm a gracious, loving, caring God. But I'm not a manipulative God. I don't always understand the ways of God, but I do understand this about God. His ways are much higher than my ways. So I've learned to trust him regardless of whether or not I know or understand what's going on around me. In Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, if any one of you who judges is without excuse, for when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on truth. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? No. We'll stand before him. People don't stand before us. And then the last thing. It'll avoid you from, it'll, it'll keep you from not judging yourself. It'll keep you from not judging yourself. If you're humble before the Lord. Look at verse 12. Therefore, it says, there is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Take time and judge yourself. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? You see, Jesus came into this world not to condemn the world, but to save it. And you and I, likewise, if we are walking in the Lord and we are walking in his statutes and we are drawing close to him and seeing ourselves 
as we really are, then our job will not be to condemn one another because that is probably the greatest challenge you are going to face this week is how you talk about other people. And when I say you, notice how many fingers are pointing this way. I'm included in this. Our greatest challenge this week is how we talk about others. And if we draw close to God, we'll be resist, we, will, we will be able to resist that temptation and look critically at our own lives and look at others' lives with concern. You're going to beat that temptation this week, aren't you? Open up your Bible. Let God speak to you. Let him show you who he is. Let him show you who you are and how you can be useful in using that tongue to build others up rather than tear them down this week. Father,